Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Autism Awareness Week at Bedford Playhouse. Uh, my name is Dan. I am the Director of Development and Programming for the Bedford Playhouse. And we have a great program today. Uh, it's kicking things off Autism 101 with uh, Dr. Stephen Kenny. Hello, Doctor. Oh, cool. uh, I just want to mention uh, before we start, that um, for those of you who are still uh, not quite up to speed on how to use Zoom at this point, shame on you, first of all, but uh, mm -hmm. you are welcome to ask questions at any time during the program using the Q&A button, which uh, if you are on your laptop or on your uh, PC should be at the bottom of your screen. And feel free, if uh, also if you're on your um, iPad or phone, I believe it's at the top of your screen. And you can post questions at any point during the conversation and we will have a little Q&A session uh, coming up at the uh, end of the program. Um, also, I should mention that uh, the Bedford Playhouse is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, so if you enjoyed tonight's program and you'd like to see us do more like it, please consider visiting our website, which is bedfordplayhouse.org uh, and making a contribution to help bring this type of programming. Uh, we really can't do it without your help. Um, we are hoping to reopen our scheduled reopening date is May 28th uh, next month. So uh, in the meantime, we are doing a lot of virtual programming. Our cafe and bar are open on weekends. You can find uh, the specials, the weekend specials on our website as well. Uh, let me introduce our special guest. Uh, Dr. Canny is the director of the Center for Autism and the Developing Brain at Wild Cornell Medical School. Uh, his current research interests focus on children with autism, targeting diagnostic tools, outcome measures, behavioral phenotyping, co-occurring symptoms, evidence-based therapies, and subthreshold symptoms. In addition to publishing in the areas of autism, Dr. Canny has also published in the areas of cognitive neuropsychology, history of neuropsychology, and pediatric traumatic brain injury. Dr. Kenny is board certified in clinical neuropsychology. Um, he also loves to teach and train, and he does workshops nationally and internationally on autism. We are very, very happy to have Dr. Kenny here with us. And it is your show, sir. All right. Well, thank you. First of all, um, I wanted to say thank you to the Bedford Playhouse for um, inviting me to give the talk. I, I absolutely love giving these talks to the community. Um, and the talk I'm giving tonight is really designed to just go over the kind of the basics of autism because we often get questions about, you know, what is it? How do you diagnose it? There's so much out there in the media about autism, um, different TV shows, different movies. Uh, just the history of it that people have lots of questions. So we just wanted to like give a talk that kind of said, here are the basics of kind of what we know now. So I'm gonna share my screen now and then um, switch it over to the right slide. Okay, so hopefully you're all seeing the correct slide right now, which is just the, the first one. So this is, you know, it's called Autism 101, where it really is just what, you know, what are we doing now in terms of the current diagnostic practices and how we do treatment approaches and you know the talk tonight really is designed more for just a kind of a broad sweeping view, um, but I plan on giving 15, 20 minutes at the end to try to answer any questions that come up. Because um, when I've given these talks in the past, um, we often get questions from the from the audience, just general ones about like what is this and what what should we look for that type of stuff. What you see there's a line drawing. I'm actually new here to Cornell. Um, I started here back in August. Came from the middle of Missouri where I ran an autism center there. And that's just a line drawing of our building, which is a converted gymnasium. It's absolutely beautiful. The architect who designed it made it very autism friendly in here. So um, it's a beautiful space that we, we currently reside in here at our center. So the first really basic question is just what is autism? We call it a spectrum now, autism spectrum disorder. Um, and, and just to be clear about what we know about it, we know that it's a neurodevelopmental disorder meaning it affects a child or an adult's brain functioning. Um, it occurs very early in life, uh, either pre or postnatally. Um, it's not something you catch when you're three or four years old. Um, you're typically born with it. Um, and if you're diagnosed with it, uh, it, you clearly have developmental consequences that are associated with it, meaning it affects how, how a person develops. And how, that, what, how we mark the disorder is the symptoms themselves that we look for really manifest themselves in two basic areas, which are how does a person communicate socially and what are these like 
different types of behaviors. How do they react to their environment that's a little bit different than other people might? Um, and we're going to go over those in more detail so you get a much clearer picture of what those two things are. The reason we call it a spectrum, and I read this really interesting article, there's, there's a big movement now and a very appropriate one in neurodiversity where, where we want to make sure people understand that as a spectrum, it's not a linear spectrum. I mean, we don't want to think of high functioning versus low function. It's really a false way to think about autism. It really is a myriad of different symptoms that can present themselves very differently in each individual. It's not linear because it's not like, oh, you're at this level or you're a six or you're a 10. It's really not that at all. It's more like just a wide variety of how these symptoms can present themselves. And that's why I really enjoy working in this field because you know, people who have autism, you know, their symptoms can vary from very not severe at all to very severe, um, a few symptoms to a lot of symptoms the same symptoms, you know, I can see a child at age two who looks very, very different when I see that same child again at age four or five. Um, not only that, but if I'm evaluating someone for a question of autism, I have no idea how they're going to present to me in clinic except for these core symptoms, meaning like autism looks different across every single individual that presents themselves to me, both in terms of the strengths they present with, but also the challenges that might they might have that would actually um, support a diagnosis of autism. So most of my work, just so you know, I'm a clinical pediatric neuropsychologist. Um, most of my clinical work is as a diagnostician, meaning i um, seeing lots and lots of kids for a question of, do you have autism or not? Um, I love this slide because <clears throat> there's so much in this one slide. And, you know, when people look at this like, oh my gosh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, autism wasn't really much of a thing. So if you look at that, it was like one in 250 in 2001, one in 500 in 1975. What is happening? Is there something in the, in the water that we're drinking that's causing autism? And we don't really think that. The prevalence is increasing where actually this slide is already outdated. It's actually one in 54 now. Um, and I think the reason why it's changing, the, the incidence itself of autism, we don't think is changing. It's the prevalence of it. By that we mean, um, what we used to define autism as was like a barrel this big, but now we think of autism as a barrel this big. So we really define autism in a much broader sense. So there are kids and adults, you know, 15 years ago that we wouldn't have recognized had autism. And we'll return this later, but I guarantee you there are people that you probably interacted with, maybe a, a coworker, a friend, um, who was just very different in the way they approached the world and saw the world they might have had autism, depending on how much they struggled with the challenges that they faced. Unfortunately, there really isn't a biological test or a cure for autism. And I know when I say that, it can sound very disheartening, meaning there's no cure for autism. Why do we have hope? Well, we have a ton of hope. Um, it just means right now, the state of science that we're in, we actually diagnose autism through its behavioral symptoms. Um, and we, we have a firm belief, grounded in lots of evidence, that it's a genetic disorder meaning you're born with it in your genes. So right now we don't have genetic cures. So, but much like everything else, you know, if you're born with a specific genetic whatever that causes a speech problem, you could go to a speech therapist and actually overcome your speech deficits where no one can recognize that you have that. And that's true in autism too. It doesn't make sure, it doesn't necessarily get rid of autism, but you can do a ton of different things to help ameliorate the symptoms of autism such that, that in, in many cases, sometimes you can't even tell. But also, this is a very serious thing. This is what I, I really want to get across to people. Um, we tend to, to romanticize autism sometimes in the media. Um, it's a very, you know, I've worked with tons of families, and it's incredibly um, uh, difficult to deal with not just for the financial burdens alone. Um, it can cost up to $60,000 a year, uh, and that's without some co-occurring symptoms, even more so if they have co-occurring symptoms. So it's, it's very it can be very um, uh, important for the family to understand and appreciate like how, how impactful the disorder can be. And it really is an equal opportunity disorder, meaning um, we see it pretty much equally in terms of incidence and prevalence across all racial and ethnic groups. Wherever we looked, the overall incidence is about a little bit more than 1% is the way we think about it. Um, and it's always seemed to be that way throughout all history. Um, it's just, we're changing how we actually conceptualize the diagnosis. So the DSM-5, if you're not aware, this is the, the diagnostic kind of manual that we use that, that is very much a cultural document because it can change over time, but it's how we currently define and diagnose the disorder. 
meaning people have to show these particular patterns of different difficulties for us to diagnose it. And just to be really clear, I always like to give this caveat when I'm talking to more community type members, it, to be diagnosed with something like, uh, um, even if you had, everyone has anxiety, but to be diagnosed with anxiety disorder, that means it's significantly impacting your functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. The same thing's true of autism. You know, if you go through these symptoms, we all are probably somewhere on the autism spectrum. We all have some symptoms of autism somewhere, yet it's when they actually um, occur to the degree that they're impairing your functioning, that's when you're gonna get a diagnosis of it. Um, so what we look for are the two main areas. We need to have deficits in social communication and this area called restricted and repetitive behaviors. So we're gonna go over those, what those look like. Um, but in addition to that, they have to be present in early childhood. So again, it's not something you catch when you're five or six. Um, they have to, as I just noted, cause clinically significant impairment in your functionings, your functioning. And the, the last one they put in, because a lot of people, you know, if someone has a significant intellectual disability, oftentimes you see impairments that can overlap with or look a lot like autism. And so we, that's a very kind of tough diagnostic question to ask, but because you can have both intellectual disability and autism, but you really have to ferret out, is it only an intellectual disability or is autism present as well? So you really have to make sure that the symptoms can't be explained by an intellectual disability. So we need three in the area, if you remember back at this slide, three deficits in the area of social communication, social interaction. So we're going to go through those three, what they look like. So the first thing is you need to have deficits in social emotional reciprocity. What does that mean? Well, um, it can range. It can mean, and again, uh, when I go through these, you might laugh because like you've known people who have done these. You might yourself have had an abnormal social approach. Um, it's the inability to really understand how to interact with people appropriately. Like there's this deficit in your ability to know how to do so. Um, so it might be you, you approach people abnormally. You might hug a stranger. Um, one of the big ones is this failure of this normal back and forth conversation. So it's, it's a true inability. We call it pragmatic language. Like they may talk at you is the way we talk about it. It's like, like, and again, you might've met people like this where you can't get a word in edgewise. Well, this is that on steroids where they only, um, they don't answer you or they only talk about their top part of the conversation. They never have that, that ping pong match back and forth of a conversation. Another part of this is a reduced sharing of interests. So, you know, if, as a younger kid, this might be taking the playground and children with autism aren't usually like looking at the other kids on the playground sometimes, you know, depending on how the autism presents. And where, you know, kids who don't have autism might be looking around at other kids in the playground and seeing what they're doing, being curious and want to run up to other kids and join in. So that's kind of what we see. But it can also be like just a, a child with autism often doesn't share interests with their parents. Um, they don't come home and show the cool thing they made at school or or they're not able to show their emotions very well, or they can't share when they're excited or let you know it's, it's really hard to read them. Um, and at the more extreme level, we have uh, kids who, who they don't initiate or respond to social interactions at all. So it's almost like they have these big, you know, Star Trek shields around them where nothing can get in and they're in their own little world is what we call that. Um, and it's, it's quite striking when they have that level of, of social emotional uh, reciprocity deficits. The second area that we look for are difficulties in nonverbals. Um, and this is interesting because you probably heard all the like trite comments about, oh, 80% of our communication is nonverbal. It's kind of true. Um, and you'd be surprised how many nonverbal things that you do. Even when I'm talking to you, I'm using my hands, my eyebrows are moving, my facial expressions change. Um, people with autism actually have a lot of difficulty with this, where um, sometimes their facial expressions are very flat. Um, that's one of the biggest things that we might see is they don't, they might have smiles and they might have frowns or crying, but all the subtle facial expressions, they're just not there. So it's kind of hard to read them. Um, they might have a failure to develop pointing appropriately. Gesturing is kind of inappropriate. One of the big ones that you hear a lot about is eye contact. And yeah, we, we do see a lot of abnormal eye contact, but I think people get that wrong a lot because it's not just that they don't make eye contact, um, actually, it's, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes they make too intense eye contact for too long. What we really look for there is an inability to socially modulate your eye contact. And if you look around when you're in a conversation with someone or if you're in a social setting, how people will use their eyes to use them socially to check in on other people's faces or to make sure you're paying attention. That's what we're looking for here. 
And then the third area in this social communication area is really this inability or difficulty in developing and maintaining relationships. And this could be friendships, this could be um, more romantic relationships. When they're kids, it could be difficulty uh, making and keeping friends. Um, and at a very more basic level, it's difficulty in even engaging in imaginative play because sometimes um, some of our kids are so concrete they can't imagine that this stick is a sword. It's just a stick. Why would I pretend it's a sword? That's silly. Um, and at the very, very, uh, again, more severe end, it's a complete absence of interest in peers or friends. So you can see from these past three slides that um, it really is a range. Even within each of these different dimensions, there can be a range and they have to meet all three of these but it can be very severe or it can be less severe depending on the child. So you can already see the range of different children um, or adults that can present, ourselves, present themselves to us that might have autism. Now the next big area is, is restricted repetitive behaviors. Um, these are the things that if you see them, you know, typically they just, they strike you as very much more atypical when a person shows them. Um, so as you can see in the, in the picture that the child's posturing and looking up at the same time, it's a very striking pose. Um, again, you can't tell anything from a photograph, but that's a child that we did capture. But it could be like hand flapping, it could be finger wiggling. So you see some of our kids flap their hands when they get excited. Um, you can see kids line up their toys. Now again, what we have to be clear is all kids line up their toys um, during development. So don't think, oh my gosh, my kid's lining up their toys, they might have autism. It's not that. It's that is the main way that they play though, is they don't play at the toys as a toy. They play at the toys by lining them up or just flipping an object around or just inspecting the objects. They don't really play or use an object the way it's intended. They use it in a different way. Another thing we look for in a very kind of um, clear way is echolalia it's called. This is where you repeat what you've heard just after you've heard it. Um, and it has no, like, if I say, uh, if I use a word or something, people don't understand, they go, did you just say blah, 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 and they'll repeat the word? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when they repeat what you say right after you say it with no semantic or language reason, they just do it for repetition. It's very striking when you hear it. Another one is idiosyncratic phrases. Um, and I smile because these can be incredibly poetic and actually accurate, but they're just idiosyncratic. And it's like, they'll hit your ears differently. Like, most people don't necessarily talk like that. Um, so, for example, we had a kid who, whenever he got anxious, would rock back and forth a little bit and say, it seems that Thanksgiving is upon us. It seems that Thanksgiving is upon us. And what he meant by that was he had, was watching Bear in the Big Blue House. And Bear uh, got a, very anxious because Thanksgiving was coming. And that's what he, he used. So this child then used that entire phrase whenever he got anxious. That's what he meant. I'm, being, I'm getting anxious right now. So it's a very idiosyncratic way of using a phrase. So you can see the lining up of toys in the background there. Um, the reason we put on this slide though is um, another, uh, you need to be two out of four in this area of repetitive behaviors. One of the four was what we just talked about, which was um, these repetitive kind of lining up and hand flapping type behaviors. This one is called insistence on sameness. And it's again, very striking. Um, it's where a child needs to do the same thing um, very, very insistently, or they have a meltdown. Again, all kids do this at some point, right? All kids have meltdowns and, and have bad behavior. This is not that, it's like this all the time where they have to drive the same way to school every day or they'll have a complete meltdown. They have to have the food arranged on their plate in the same way or they have a meltdown. You have to say something uh, in a very particular way or they have a meltdown. Um, this one, by, uh, quite honestly, is one that, that sneaks by a lot of people, but you can imagine it has the most impact on school, on daily functioning. Because if they can't be flexible, I mean, and you'd be surprised how much flexibility our world requires, um, they have lots of behavior problems and lots of difficulty. The third area in the repetitive behaviors is restricted um, or fixated interests or special interests, we call them. Um, this, is, I, this is actually one of my areas of research because I just love this area. Um, and again, like there are things that all kids like, which is why they become popular, like dinosaurs and Thomas the Train or trucks. But this is that, again, on steroids. It's like the only thing they care about or study about or read about or what toys or what wallpaper or bed spreads about is that topic. So Thomas the Train, everything has to be about Thomas the Train. So they don't have other interests. It consumes all of their interests. 
Um, and these can even become very unusual. Um, like we had, a, I had a kid who, who um, I worked with who loved vacuum cleaners and he was what, seven. And if you said, hi, my name's Susan, he would say, oh, hi, Susan, what kind of vacuum cleaner do you have? Like, that's the first thing that he asked. And he would, uh, by the way, he would get upset if you don't have a Dyson because that's the best kind of vacuum cleaner to him. And he went to, he went to your house, he would go to your closet and look what kind of vacuum cleaners you have. And he knew every detail about vacuum cleaners that you'd ever want to know. So it's an unusual interest, which is even more striking than something like Thomas the Train. So we look for that as well. And the fourth area, which came about in the DSM-5, thank God, was this hypo or hyper reactivity to sensory. Now, these days, a lot of people are fixating on sensory stuff with kids with autism, and rightly so. Um, however, if you think about sensory issues, we all have them. We all have different sensory responses. Some of us like tags, some of us don't. Um, my wife uh, doesn't like heavy covers. Um, I do. Some people like lights, some people don't. So we, there's a normal distribution of sensory issues. This again is that on steroids. Um, we see a lot of what we call sensory seeking behaviors that are atypical. Visual inspection will look out the corner of their eye at something or lay on the ground to watch wheels or sit there and stare at water dripping for an hour. Um, or uh, they could be covering their ears as a sensory aversion uh, because they, there's even a typical sound that doesn't bother us bothers them. Um, someone who leans down and licks the table to see how it tastes, that's just not typical that you see in other kids. So we really do, again, look for more of an extreme end of, of that piece of it as well. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just for general knowledge, um, there have been changes. This is about, what, five years ago, I guess now, where the DSM-4 uh, had a different conceptualization where we actually had Asperger's disorder, PDD-NOS, and autistic. All those were under the umbrella of autism. And in the DSM-5, they have all become under just termed autism. Um, a lot of people are upset about that because Asperger's is very meaningful. Um, but if you think about it, it's like, it's just a, a type of autism is the way we think about it. And three symptoms are down to two now where, because you know, if you think about it, you can't really be social without communication. So it made sense that those collapse into one dimension. This is a really important slide to me too, um, just because you might, in the center, you see these core symptoms, which cause, you know, impairments in autism. But the interesting thing about autism, it hardly ever comes, and that's what we just went through, all those different criteria. But autism comes with so much more than just those core symptoms. It comes with oftentimes anxiety or depression or intellectual problems, or the inability to take care of themselves in the real world or learning problems, sometimes gait problems or fine motor issues, sometimes behavioral dysregulation or seizures. So there's always, almost always something else that is going on that affects these kids' lives and adults' lives even more. You know, if you had to put these in buckets, um, these are the different types of uh, disorders in terms of comorbidity that, that are considered different from autism, but um, come with it a lot in terms of like people meet the criteria for this as well. Now this next slide is, is not supposed to be scary, but it kind of is because this is a friend of mine here, uh, Jeremy Beenster Vanderweel is a, a very famous psychiatrist here. Uh, and this is just to show the complexity of what autism is. So you have the genetics involved and we're learning so much more about the genetics. Um, about, I'd say 30 to 40% of the cases of autism, we can now identify the genetic issue. It's not a single gene, it's called a polygenetic disorder. And where we know that there's multiple genes that actually affect common pathways that create the behavioral manifestation of what we're calling autism. But then you have different biomarkers that we're looking for, different mental comorbidities, behavioral comorbidities, and they all come together to create autism. So when I have a child or an adult present to me and say, do I have autism? This is what I need to keep in my head. Like, what is it amongst all these things? Is it autism or is it just one of a single thing alone? So a lot of our kids with autism and our adults have difficulty with behavior. Um, yeah, this is true of kids with intellectual disability well, but they're at much higher risk for behavioral problems like aggression. Um, they, uh, a high percentage of our kids, over 50%, can engage in acting out behaviors like hitting and kicking others. Um, what's incredibly uh, difficult to watch and see is when they start injuring themselves. I worked in a, a, a severe behavior disorder clinic where these kids would hit themselves so hard they detached their own retinas. I mean, it was, it was frightening what they could do to hurt themselves. Um, they can throw things, uh, you know, when they have their meltdowns, we really do mean meltdowns. 
but then they can also go into self-stimulation while they might do hand flapping or scripting. And you can imagine how all these things, um, if you're in a school or other type of setting, um, sets these kids apart even more than other kids and creates difficulty with their social interactions. I want to pause for a second on the last one because um, the, the largest cause of death in autism, those diagnosed with autism, is drowning. And um, a lot of it has to do with that last bullet point where a lot of our kids elope, which means that um, they will, like, even if you like, some of my parents you know, bolt their doors and lock them. And even with that, the kids will elope and get out of the house. And for some reason they're drawn to bodies of water and don't have a, a sense of safety. And they'll oftentimes either cross a street that's dangerous or head to a body of water where drowning is a hazard. So one thing we work with in communities is encouraging parents of, of kids who showed these types of symptoms to make sure first responders know so that when you call the police, the first place they go is to bodies of water to make sure that they're safe. Another one that's, again, in, incredibly um, frightening in some ways and concerning is uh, suicidality in autism. So as our kids get older, especially into um, adolescent age, there's a much higher uh, incidence of depression and anxiety in our population. Um, so in one of our studies, adults with autism were 10 times more likely to die by suicide in a Swedish study they did, a population study. Um, and even in here, what we see is, is more su suicidal elevation in our samples. So it's just something you want to keep your ears open for and take it seriously when you hear it. It can be hard to figure out, so you want to screen for it. But a lot of our kids, they'll say things and they're very concrete and they don't mean exactly what they're saying. So you really do have to figure out what's happening when they make these comments. So there's been a lot of, a ton of interest in environmental factors um, in autism, meaning like what's causing this? I mean, I'll get lots of parents who are concerned, oh my gosh, was it that third cup of coffee that I had? You know, why? And we do know um, that epigenetics and environmental factors can play a role. It's not just straight, like, are they born with it? I mean, that's true of every genetic condition is how the genetics interact with the environment can actually change the manifestation of a disorder. So we know, for example, there's an increased risk of autism with paternal and maternal age. Premature babies have a higher risk of having autism. Um, there are some epidemiological studies that do show that certain environmental factors, like there's a study in California that showed along the highway system, there was a greater risk of autism. That doesn't mean, by the way, just to be clear, that, that toxins cause autism. What that means is they interact with the genetics to change the manifestation of the disorder, just to be clear about that. Um, and just the strongest evidence, you know, as a scientist, vaccines do not contribute to the risk of autism. This has been a, a battle that we've been fighting for a long time. And if you know the history of this, you'll know why we get very passionate about it. Um, but there's no evidence that vaccines themselves cause autism. We are, though, learning a ton about the genetics of autism. Um, you know, we hoped 10 years ago that we could find a single gene that caused autism. Uh, that ended up not being the case. There isn't a single gene. I think we now know of about, oh, maybe 90 to 100 single genes that cause autism, um, but that's only accounts for, I forget, like 10 or 15 percent. Most of the cases of autism are polygenetic, meaning a combination of different genes that are working together, um, but it's a highly genetic disorder. And, and you can see from that bullet point that, you know, we know that from twin studies that, you know, the concordance of ASD symptoms is much higher in identical versus fraternal twins. Um, and you know, about 93% is the maximum, but we think the risk is heritable um, uh, for autism. So it's one of the most heritable psychiatric disorders that we know of actually. Um, and it, again, sibling studies, if you have one sibling, if you have a child with autism, your chances of having another child with autism are much greater just because of the genetics involved. We also know that um, there's not one single genetic disorder that is, is, is perfectly penetrant for autism. By that I mean it's like, oh, you have this genetic issue, you're going to have a deletion or a duplication or a, a de novo event, you're going to have autism. It doesn't work like that. What we found is different genetic syndromes have a higher incidence of autism. So again, it, it wasn't as clear as we thought it might be. And not to dive too much, and this is not my area, so please no one ask me questions about this. But like, I do work with geneticists where there's so many new things that they're studying. The, the field of genetics is expanding so rapidly because of technology and and science, um, but things like copy number variants, spontaneous mutations, how epigenetics, so epigenetics, just to let you know, that's when um, we, we, two people might have the same genetics, um, but epigenetics are genes that turn on and off other genes 
depending on the environment around them. That's probably the most simplistic explanation. Um, so you can see how that allows the environment to affect your genes. And we do know epigenetics play a role, and not only your genes, but the genes of your, your, your children. Um, so we know that plays a role in autism too. And we're just trying to figure out kind of what is happening in the world of autism genetically. And just to make an analogy, like back in the 50s, 1950s, like all we knew about cancer was the end stage. Like, oh, that person has cancer, look what it looks like. But with science and years and years of study, we thought, well, actually there's like hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of cancer that look many different ways, that have different genetics associated with and respond to different treatments. So that's kind of where we're at with autism. Um, we're now realizing that it's not a single thing. There are not, there's not an autism, there are autisms. It's a behavioral presentation that has many different genetic pathways to get there. And we're trying to figure out, okay, what are those genetic pathways? What are the, the prognosis associated with them? And then what are treatments that we can target based on those? Which kind of leads us to the treatment thing. What do we do? We've done a lot of work um, with what we have now available to us in terms of, um, and here at our center, we only promote evidence-based treatments, meaning I will only engage in treatments um, that have research and evidence behind them that they work. Um, if you Google autism treatments, it's frightening. Um, there's like 400 different treatments that pop up and it could be this field, like many, if there's a vacuum of science, people jump in with um, some people that don't, aren't well-intentioned and just wanna sell something um, or don't have enough science or there's testimonials that say they work and people get on the bandwagon. And I'll be honest, if I was a parent of a child with autism, I would do anything to help my kid get better and I wouldn't wait. And yet what we wanna do from our side of it is say, no, you know, what I would recommend to parents though are treatments that we know work. Um, and they might not work for every kid. Uh, that's what we're trying to figure out what works best for what kids. But there are certain treatments we know can do a really good job of, of helping almost every kid. Um, and that's what you see in front of you there. <laughs> so what you see there is just a really easy graph of evidence-based core treatments, early intervention. The earlier we get to these kids, we know it will help them. And that's because the brain changes. That's not to say you should not treat people who are older. That's not what we're saying. Um, we're just saying, it's like, think about it this way. If I was able to help a child when they're three years old um, instead of five, the five-year-old missed that two years of practicing with other kids and learning how to be social that the, the three-year-old that I treated can get by the time they're five. So the earlier we get to the kids, the better. If you haven't in the world of autism heard of ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis, it's one of the most evidence-based treatments for autism and one of the most highly recommended. Um, ABA got a, a really bad rap way, I'd say back in the 2000s or so, um, but I, I don't want people now to think ABA is the same as it was then. Um, ABA was actually like some, a science that was born in the 50s uh, for actually adults with um, intellectual disabilities. And it's really just how using behavioral science to change behavior. Um, and now it's all positive reinforcement based. Um, so they don't do any type of punishment stuff, but it, it is having seen it work with many, many kids, it is unbelievable what it can do and how it can change these kids' lives. Um, it's now evolving. The ABA principles are evolving into many other type of, of therapies like the next one, the natural, naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions that incorporate ABA principles, but add to them with naturalistic environments and play-based therapies and other stuff that have come a long, long way and have evidence now that they're very effective. But social skills, you know, medications, there's no drug yet that treats autism core symptoms. But what they do do is treat the other comorbid symptoms that we talked about. If I can dial back the ADHD, if I can dial back seizures, if I can dial back OCD type behaviors, um, it really helps us then with the other behaviors that we need for autism. So medications are often a, a big part of the treatment for autism. Teach was out of North Carolina. It's an entire method of teaching kids and working with them with autism that also incorporates behavioral principles with others. So when it comes to treating it, um, as you, as you probably got the message, um, autism isn't just one thing, right? So it's really hard to say, this is the one treatment that's gonna work for everybody. So even the behavioral treatments that I talked about have to be very individualized for that patient. So what would happen is someone would come to us and we're like, okay, let's do an evaluation, find out where their strengths are. Because you know, when it comes to autism, these kids have tons of strengths that you wanna build on those strengths like anything else, right? If anyone comes to us that wants help, okay, what are your strengths? Where are your challenges? How can we use the strengths 
can address your challenges. So it has to be goal-driven, evidence-based, but it really does have to take into account the child and the family along with it. Um, you know, as we, as we know from COVID, we've all learned, it, it's really hard to, to be a teacher and be a parent, meaning going out to work and do other stuff at the same time. So being able to, to, to take into account the entire family is very, very important. Um, so we really do want to try to get these kids into some type of behavioral interventions as early as possible if we can, but it's never too late. So I wanna be sure that you understand that too. By the way, the problem often is, is driven by like sadly insurance, like what is paid for by as a treatment for autism, which is, is very, very sad to me. Um, but also social skills, training and social language groups are also very helpful, especially for adolescents and for adults. They just have less um, kind of uh, evidence behind them. They actually are doing as good of a job as the behavioral treatments, but there is a growing evidence that they do help. So as I said, there are no specific medications that treat the core symptoms of autism. Um, and the pharmacology associated with it is, is really, like I said, focusing on these comorbid symptoms. So you can see from there, there are specific medications that have been approved for autism. What's really interesting to me though, is like, if you look at the ADHD ones, those are just standard you know, medications that you would give to any child with ADHD. If you have a child with autism that has ADHD, you do want to go to a doctor or a psychiatrist that knows autism because the kid's response or the adult's response to these meds aren't exactly the same. They don't have the same efficacy and they're just a little bit more nuanced than a kid who doesn't have autism. So having uh, someone you can go to that has autism expertise is, is super important to, to, to increasing the, the chance that those drugs are going to work. But three-fourths of our, our kids and adults were on some type of medication last year by one of our, our studies. Um, and you know, in the US especially, it's common that we, we treat some of these comorbid symptoms with some type of medication. So that's why though too, so the way I think about it is like internal and external, you know, if we use the medication to kind of dial things back, you really want to focus on behavioral treatments because we have found those to be very effective for improving the skills that the kids need to be improved but then actually reducing some of these other challenging behaviors that we see. The earlier, the better. Um, almost every study shows that the earlier we can get them in, the better. Um, and again, the sad thing is right to this point, we still haven't, there's there some medications that we're actually looking at to see if they're effective in treating core autism, like oxytocin and others, but nothing unfortunately is really panning out from the research side. So we talked about ABA. I'm not gonna go in depth into this. I have a couple slides on it, but I'm gonna kind of blow through them kind of fast. Um, and the reason why is if you've heard about this, it really isn't a single technique, it's a family of techniques. And you know, without actually going into too much detail on the slides, um, what, I'm gonna get to this slide here, Whoop, here we go. You all have done EBA, um, just not as to the level they do it. If you've ever, um, you know, if you ever have a, if you have a significant other or friend or someone in your relationship with that did something nice to you, so you give them a gift or flowers or something, you're practicing ABA. You're saying, here's a positive behavior. I'm going to reinforce it so that it increases the chances of that positive behavior again. And what do you do when something bad happens? You know, that, the, that your partner, your significant other, your friend does that you don't like? You ignore it. If you ignore it long enough, it will go away because they're not getting reinforced. That's <clears throat> the basic behavioral principle of ABA. The difference is that they bring it to a level of science. Um, and it really is incredibly impressive if you see that. It looks like they're just playing with the kids but they actually do what's called a functional behavioral analysis first to see what is the function of the behavior, target that, try different things. And actually they have graphs that track how that behavior goes up or down. And if you've ever even tried to get your child to, you know, a baby to stop crying through the night or having your child go to bed at the right time, you know what we're talking about. This can be very difficult, seems easy, it's not. So having professionals that are licensed and have lots of um, ability to do this and are talented is an extremely powerful thing. And that's why ABA has become one of the most successful ways to treat autism. And then I only have like a couple more slides. I just wanna end on, a, to me, one of the most important kind of aspects of, of our job here. Um, Cause you know, our, to be clear, our, our patient is the child or the adult that, that possibly or does have autism, but it, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And what you find is you really do have to think about the effect and the impact on families. Um, you know, if you think about it, if you have a child with autism with any type of special needs, 
Um, how do you tend to other child, children in your home? Well, what about their siblings? You're paying less attention to them because you're paying more attention to this child's needs. How do these tantrums affect the whole family? If you ever had a kid who has significant tantrums every time you bring them to Walmart or to a restaurant, you know what that feels like. You don't, you stop going to restaurants. Um, what do you do when they start? Sure, when they're young, two years old, you can stop the aggression, but what about when they're eight or nine? Suddenly they're, it hurts a lot more because they're a lot bigger and stronger. I had a, a family who the kid only slept two hours a night for the first five years. Can you imagine that? So you, you're losing sleep. You have, have to navigate the medical issues, seizure disorders, um, GI problems they might have. And I guarantee you almost everyone has their own opinion and criticism. There's always aunt so-and-so who says, all you have to do is spank them or they have a, a friend over here that says like, why aren't you disciplining like this? And the teacher says, they don't have autism. So, oh my gosh, you get advice from everyone. These families are bombarded with all these different stressors from everywhere. Um, and if you're the family, a parent themselves, you worry about what the future, what happens if I leave? What's gonna happen if, when I pass away? What about my child? Um, the friends, all of our families lose friends because of their focus on the child with autism. It takes, as I told you, an enormous amount of money. What about the whole IEP system like, or SSI? You have to navigate all these new systems of care and worry about your child running out the front door at any time. So it is just, you can imagine how incredibly stressful it is. So you know, one thing we are focused on here is creating what we call a medical home or a health-based home or an autism medical home, where it really is, it's, it's about the patient, but it has to be more than that. It has to be about the whole family. We have to, it's not just, yes, your child has autism or not. And I get very passionate too about like just the diagnostic question because it's not just about the diagnostic question. It's about how do we help? How do we make the child, you know, do their best they can in life? How do we coordinate things across all these different you know, professionals? Um, how do we do so in a way that is highest quality and equitably so? So across financial spectrums and racial spectrums, how do we make sure we access, you know, have access to our care as much as possible? It's kind of a, a difficult, you know, mission to have. It's something we're all committed to here. Um, my last slide, just to show you kind of our center, it's on a beautiful 200 acre campus here um, at Westchester and they converted the gymnasium to an autism center. And they had a, a specialist come in who was a, um, an architect and made it very autism friendly. So with the colors, it's like a little, if you look on the lower left-hand side, it's a little village, every room is a little house. So what I love about this is, is our mission is baked into our building. Meaning like if you look at our building, you'll understand what our mission is. All right, so I kind of blew through that pretty quickly. There's a lot of information, um, but I wanted to make sure that I have about, oh, maybe 15 minutes or so to answer whatever questions we might have. So um, let me stop sharing my screen and. Okay, well, we actually have some, a lot of really good questions uh, teed up. So um, let's get right to them. Um, the first one, uh, and I wanna make sure I read this correctly. Uh, in your estimation, what percentage of autism cases are initially misdiagnosed as other conditions? Great question. I think it really depends. Um, I know I, hate, I sound like a politician now. I've been watching so much politics. I've learned how to answer questions very evasively. I don't mean to do that. Um, but autism, because of the behavioral diagnosis, the problem is I think initially, um, depend, if you don't go to the right specialist, that you find it's misdiagnosed more often, meaning a lot of people miss it. Um, because they just, you know, a pediatrician who doesn't know autism very well, I've heard all the stories like, oh my gosh, don't worry, they'll, you know, it's a boy, they'll talk later, um, they got this from their brother. I would, yeah, and just like any other disorder, there are hits and misses, false negatives, false positive with what we do. Um, just so you know, our diagnostic rate, that's what we're getting very good at. Um, our diagnostic rate by the age of two is like 90% or over 90% stable as they get older. So we're very good at recognizing it. If you get to the right specialist though, that's the key, right? Um, because you, you, get, you have to get to someone who knows autism. If you don't, you know, the rates go much higher in terms of the inaccuracies involved. I get very scared of computer programs and like screen devices that you just answer questions. They tell you if you have autism or not. That's not the way it goes. Um, you know, what we look for is very sophisticated in terms of diagnosing autism and its history and how we interact with the child and what we do that actually produces the diagnosis. So. Um, somewhat related to that, um, another question is, uh, does autism pair with other conditions? Yeah, it does. So, um, well, that I say, let me answer that differently. Um, autism is not protective of other conditions, meaning like 
you can have any other condition that anyone might get if you have autism as well. Um, that being said, like we often see, like that slide I showed you showed that where it's like, we often see ADHD type symptoms. We often see anxiety. We also see depression. We often see GI problems. We often see um, uh, seizure disorders. So there, there are much higher rate in our population of kids than in others. Uh, next question is, um, since we all have differences, is there a way to see signs that we need to pay attention to? It's challenging as a parent to know when and how to look at your own children. Um, can you talk to that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, and it's a great question because like, you're right. Uh, like we all, as I went through those, those symptoms, we can all go, oh my gosh, I might have autism. Like I love Star Wars. That's all I talk about, you know? So we all have differences. And, and you know, part of the world we live in is honoring and respecting those differences and not pathologizing them, right? Not saying, oh my gosh, they're weird. They must have autism. It's not that at all. Um, so there are certain things, you know, that's why, again, why you come to a specialist to say, are there, there are very specific signs and symptoms that we look at that create the diagnosis. Um, and it has to be an impairment. It's not just that a, someone might be a little bit atypical or a little bit odd. That's not what we're looking for. I think we're all, you know, children, all children are odd, but I think every children is weird or odd in some way. Um, let, let me answer it a different way though, too. There was a study that was done that showed that 84% of the time or higher that the mom was concerned there's something wrong with their kid, there was. Um, so meaning like if you go, you know, the mom's like, oh my gosh, I think there's something wrong with little Joey. Believe her, like, go get it evaluated, go to a pediatrician, do the screening, whatever you need to do. Don't take no for an answer. Um, dads weren't as good because dads weren't, dads weren't the primary caretakers. And opposite wasn't true when the mom wasn't worried, that did not correlate with whether the child had something or not. But what we learned is like, um, whoever that primary caretaker is, if their instincts are like, there's something going on here, we need it checked out, listen to them. So that being said, you know, I see the question too, like, what do, what do we look for at certain ages? Like, um, you can look for, there's a couple websites, like the Early Signs website that you can go for, which says, here's what we look for um, in autism. Like, if you're starting to see these things, and they're to a certain degree, you might want to get them checked out at a higher level of screening. Um, if you're worried even to a greater degree, if you just Google MCHAT, M-C-H-A-T, there's a free screening um, that even has little follow-up questions that does a pretty good job of screening for autism or not. And again, if you score in the range, it doesn't mean your child has autism. It just means like, well, there's enough concerns here where we might wanna take it to the next level. Um, now, as a diagnostician, I mean, I could go on forever about what I look for at different ages um, for, you know, like, well, there are certain things that all kids should be doing at certain ages. And if I don't see that, I'm worried. One of the biggest things, of course, is language. You know, if you don't have single words by a uh, year, 18 months of age, and if you're not in phrases by two years of age, you need to have your child checked out, either by a language therapist, or it could be something else going on like autism. If you start to see always, if there's any like going down in anything, kids don't regress in abilities. They only usually increase. If you ever see a, a regression in anything, take them to the doctor. Uh, whether it be language or social skills or even physical things, there's kids shouldn't go down, they should continue to go up to a certain age. Um, and then at a specialist level, we look for things like when do they smile, when do they point, when their facial expressions there, those types of things. So it gets more complicated then. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions that are, are somewhat related. Um, one that was submitted uh, through the Q&A, uh, uh, my brother and ex-husband are on the spectrum, my 23 year old daughter has symptoms particularly social. She's asked if I think she's on the spectrum. I think she is. Would it be beneficial to her to get a diagnosis now? And related to that, we had someone submit a question uh, via email, um, kind of the same thing, talking about uh, someone is convinced that their father, who is 74, is on the spectrum. But of course, it was unknown when he was young. Um, is there any anything that is it worth doing anything now at his age? So I guess two different adult yeah. questions. Those are really, really, really good questions. Um, so, because we often get asked this by a parent about a child as well. So think about it this way. So in your first question about the two parents who have, have been identified, you know, should they, should they encourage their daughter to? One thing to reflect on is what did it mean as when the parents themselves got the diagnosis, what did that mean to them, right? So what I hear a lot, from, from people who are on the spectrum, and I am not, so I can't speak with that voice fully, but my anecdotally, what I hear is, if there's something going on with you, um, you know, if I'm living my life and I'm running into difficulties 
and I don't know why I'm having those difficulties, um, you start to like create all these reasons in your head that are sometimes worse than the real reason. So what I've heard is that if I go to someone and I find out, oh, this is the reason why you're feeling that way. This is the reason why you're different. It's actually um, a good thing for them is what I've been told. That's not always the case, but I've been told it can be free. It's like, oh, the reason I have this, this these problems socially or whatever is because I have autism. It's not because I'm a bad person or my mom did this or whatever. It's like, there's a reason. So having that reason as an organizing principle that can be very beneficial psychologically for people. And then it also gives you a course of treatment, right? It's like, oh, if I have this, I know what direction I have to go. The bad side that people think about though is, is the, the label, you know, oh gosh, I'm gonna be set in a category. I have a label. Um, and you know, this is where you run into people who have, you know, stigma associated with the word or like they think everyone with autism is like Rain Man or something. It's like, and that's so not true, right? So that's the, the bad side of it though. Like you get categorized as something. You know, I think the world is becoming more aware of the spectrum and kind of the neurodiversity that goes with it. Um, so in my mind, I mean, and this is my opinion only, I, I would think there's more benefit than less to, to be diagnosed and to have it checked out. Because um, a, a lot of people have symptoms or especially if you have relatives that have autism, you might have symptoms but not meet the diagnostic criteria for autism. And the question then becomes like, well, wait, is it impairing you though? Because you know you can have you can have all the symptoms in the world, but doing fines, who cares? You know it doesn't affect you at all. But if it's impairing you somewhere and hurting you or hurting your ability to be the best you, then yeah, like get it checked out and find out if that's what it is and get the right direction. Does your center treat adults? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have to be honest. Uh, we do, but not as much as I'd like. To. Um, you know, like the the world of autism is mostly a pediatric world, but we. Uh, we do treat adults and we need to up our game even more with adults. Uh, next question is, are there certain foods that will help with the behavior of autistic children, like a gluten-free diet, for example? Yeah, so most, if not all the evidence to date has shown that gluten-free diets do not help with core symptoms of autism. Um, and that was kind of one of the things that was way out even 10 years ago. I mean, it became, not, I don't wanna say a fad, but it became a big thing. But let me clarify, a lot of our kids that have autism have GI issues. There, there's definitely a link there, um, more so than the general population. Um, one of the difficulties is we don't know why that is, um, and it's not considered one of the core symptoms of autism. But I had one GI doctor explain to me this way, which for some reason made a lot of sense to me. It's like, okay, so if I was talking to you and you were allergic to certain foods and every time you ate, your stomach cramped up and you felt like total yuck, um, and that was, but you couldn't communicate very well. Like what was wrong with you? If I actually fix that, you're going to improve all the way around. You're going to be in a better mood. You're going to be better deal with your environment. So I think that's the way that a lot of us are conceptualizing it. So the answer is yes, it can definitely help a child. You want to definitely, um, you want to make sure though, that that's what's really going on. Like it's not every good autism has gluten, you know, casein free problems that would benefit from being having that type of diet. It's really expensive and hard to do. Um, so what you do is just try it, see if it works and see if it helps um, and see if anyone else notices because you'll have your own placebo effect. Um, but for the most part, unless there's showing significant GI issues, um, we don't usually recommend that unless there's specific symptoms associated with it. Uh, next question is, how do you determine if a behavior like lining up toys or shoes or asking repetitive questions is an anxiety type behavior or if it's autism, uh, if the child almost seems to have some OCD type of issues? Yeah, and that's one of the differentials that we really try to get to is trying to ferret that out. And that takes a little bit of digging, right? So one is kids with autism line up toys because they like to. Um, it's their way of, that's the only way like to play with toys. It's very important to them. They get mad when they're not, um, which is a lot different than if I'm lining up toys because it, this is where that FBA, I talked about that functional behavior analysis comes in. What is the function of that behavior? Why are you lining up toys? Is it only happening when you're anxious or in anxious situations? Or if they're relaxed at home and lining up toys, well, that doesn't make sense because they're not anxious, right? Um, so then the OCD part is, are there more compulsive tendencies? Um, not to you know throw around the big words, but OCD tends to be what they call ego dystonic, meaning um, people with OCD are aware of and don't like the compulsion. They're like, I know I have to wash my hands, but I don't like it. I know I have to close the door three times, but I don't like it. Because with autism, it's not. It's called ego syntonic where they actually, it's something they like to do. It's not something they don't like to do. So there are different ways that we can actually figure out 
if it is more OCD or if it's more of a stim or a repetitive behavior that we see. Um, I should just mention real quick, just as a reminder that we are actually recording tonight. So um, we will be sending out the link for this recording to everyone who's uh, who signed on uh, in case you ever wanna go back and reference a certain point of uh, Dr. Canny's presentation um, or any of the other questions that have been asked. And uh, we will also include some additional information. So if you want more information about things like MChat, um, we can include that uh, in, in that messaging. Um, so another question is, uh, one example of like when uh, someone's son was in school and uh, someone ha had a classmate who was on, on the spectrum, uh, parents were complaining about the time that child took away from the rest of the class. How can schools and parents learn to understand how to be sympathetic and compassionate towards children on the spectrum? Yeah, I, I heard you from Vanessa. Um, what a great question too, because I think that I would actually generalize that to the world today, <laughs> number one, not just to school. And number two, not just about autism. Uh, you know, we hear the same complaint about kids with ADHD or a traumatic brain injury, or even that's in a wheelchair. Uh, so whenever you have any child with a special need that requires more attention, you'll have a certain group of people get mad about that. Well, that's taking attention from the rest of the class. Or, you know, what's interesting, if you study neurodiversity, um, whenever you have inclusion as part of your, your programmatic baked in, um, it actually, you find it, it improves the class dynamics, improves team dynamics, it improves the compassion of the whole class. And that's modeled from above, by the way. So meaning like if the teacher is able to show acceptance and be able to um, incorporate those things and that's modeled for the rest of the students and the parents, then there are, the benefits are extreme with regard to being able to, to incorporate in those kids. It's, it's just a sad state of our world though that that's often not the case, you know? And, you know, I'm not trying to be judgmental because I, as a parent myself, you know, I want my child to learn. I get mad if the, the parent or the teacher's always paying attention to the, the behavior problem kid over there. So it's just about inclusivity. It's about the other part of it though is, is the separate is like, well, we as a society and schools, we need to give the kids the right support to succeed. It's not fair to the teacher having 30 kids to have to deal with a kid, you know, who's having any type of behavioral problems, right? So we want to make sure, and again, this is about resources, about money, this is about the school system, this is about like work, it's work settings in the same way. How do we as a society get the right resources to support our kids to succeed in the best way? Uh, so you have a, we have two more questions that are sort of related. Um, one that is in the forum here and another one that was asked sort of uh, in advance of by email. So the first question is, again from Vanessa, is what age should a parent be attentive to these sorts of differences and start looking into a diagnosis? And then the other question that came in, which is what advice do you have for uh, parents who may be somewhat in denial? Two good questions. And Vanessa can't ask any more questions. She's done. Vanessa's done for that. <laughs> Uh, okay, let me answer it a different way. One is, you know, we are able to um, diagnose autism reliably, uh, actually as young as 12 months of age, if the symptoms are there and obvious, um, and which might be something I find shocking. It's like, wow, that's so young. But that's only in, in kids at that age who are showing significant symptoms. Um, by two years of age, we're very good and very stable. There are a small subgroup of kids at two years of age that are just on the edge of it that we have them come back within six months and a lot of them end up having autism, but still, so, you know, by age of three for sure, but we can diagnose as young as 12. Um, two years is, is well within our wheelhouse of being able to see the symptoms. Um, so I, what you can look for, what you should be concerned about, again, use your instincts. If there's anything, the problem with a lot of first time parents is they don't compare it. They don't, you know, most parents don't know what a little baby's supposed to do. A lot of doctors don't know. Like if I asked a doctor, when is the first time a baby's supposed to smile? They don't know. They know what goes wrong, but you know, when is, when is the average child actually walk? We don't know that. We know when it's delayed, but we don't know the average range of babies walking. So, you know, like I said, the markers, the early signs, I would actually recommend going to, if you just Google early signs autism, you'll come up with a website that actually does a really good job of saying, here's what we look for at different ages that if you're not seeing this by this point, kind of be concerned. You know, if you're not seeing pointing by this age, you're not seeing smiling by this age, sharing, it kind of goes through that in a very easy or, or more clear way. But even beyond that, if you are a parent and you're concerned, let, let your pediatrician know. And if, you don't, if you're not satisfied with the pediatrician's response, push it, you know, take it up to the next level. Like don't take no for an answer. Um, that's my advice because I, you know how many stories I've heard like, oh, the pediatrician or whoever said, don't worry about it. And now it's been three or four years. I wish I would have said, so don't. 
go with your instincts is what I would suggest for that. The denial question, wow, that's a lot harder, right? Because um, you know, any parent doesn't want to hear anything usually about their their child that is something's wrong with them. Um, what I learned to do, I've actually had personal experiences with this where I've had relatives. I'm like, this is what I do. I'm like, oh gosh, I'm afraid to tell them. You can't tell them if they're not ready to hear. It won't help. Um, ethically, you might feel like you need to. Like you might point out in a very gentle way, like, hey, you know, I've noticed a little bit of differences here. Um, have you noticed them compared to other kids? So I would do it in a question, curious way, and then I'd see what response I got. You know, if the response was militant, no, I would back off a little bit and just let them know, like, I'm here um, if you need them. But if, if they are open to it at all, then I would push it a little bit more and say, yeah, I know it's another kid like this. Have you ever thought about this? Um, and push it. But your the denial piece is, is really hard. As a professional, it's even harder because I feel it's my job um, to even sometimes leap beyond the personal part and say, like, no, you're this is something important that you need to look at. And sometimes you need they just need to hear it objectively. So if you can actually have someone else who's more objective tell them that, that's even better. <laughs> so. All right, uh, we have time for one more. Um, so I think uh, what would be a useful question is, um, are there any uh, uh, caregiver groups that people can join or uh, support groups that people can join uh, to either deal with their own issues or to lend support to others? The answer is yes. Um, the, uh, the real kind of, um, Disadvantage I'm at is I'm new to the area. I just moved here like four months ago, so I'm not the best person to ask. I can tell you though that Autism Speaks is everywhere, including New York. Um, and they, if you went on their website, they would have a list of resources as well. Um, we also have a social worker and stuff here that can guide people to different resources with regard to support groups. Um, it's a great question. And let me just end it by saying, um, you know, I know it's unsatisfactory. They're not able to say what the support group might be but I have been told by parents that the most help that they've ever gotten isn't from someone like me, who's the doctor talking about this, it's from other parents who have lived experiences similar to theirs. So I know there are, there are email support groups, there are Facebook groups, Autism Speaks is a group. Um, so without being able to say exactly what those groups are, I can tell you definitely pursue that though because you're not alone out there if you're dealing with this. I guarantee, even though you feel that way, well, it might even feel more that way as it progresses and you navigate through the systems, but one of your best sources of support are gonna be other parents that have gone through it as well. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Haney. This was great. Uh, I wanna say uh, we really appreciate your time uh, for, and spending uh, an hour with us. And again, to everybody who tuned in, we will be sharing the recording with you um, please share it. Um, if, you know, and Dr. Kenny, can I ask if um, if anybody has any additional questions they'd like to follow up with? Uh, is it okay for us to uh, reach out to you and perhaps direct them to the proper place Absolutely. to get that? Yeah, yeah. If they have your email or whatever, send them to your and send them my way. We can try to help out as much as All we right. can. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. And, um, everybody and, have uh, a great evening. And again, thank you for you guys for doing it. It's a great community service. So thank really you. And I hope uh, I hope if you're interested, we'll see you tomorrow night for our next program, which is art and autism, which awesome. should be a really fascinating talk. Right. Thank you, everybody. So, Take care. Have a good night. Bye-bye.